The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program, depending on their content. I'll be introducing our next speakers this afternoon, and I can tell you with confidence that you're in for a treat. And the reason I know this is that uh, we put together a conference in Nevada last year and invited these three guys from Caltrans to talk about crackless bridge decks, and the reviews were very positive. So I think we're very privileged to have today three gurus when it comes to bridges from Caltrans. This includes Rick Magenti, Sonny Ferrero, and Craig Knapp. Welcome. I'd like to thank God for being invited to do this. It's uh, certainly a privilege, and it's fun. We're, we were kind of excited because, you know, we, we, we were pretty successful in putting down um, bridge decks that didn't crack. And as you know, ever since, you know, there's been concrete, there's, there's been an issue with, with cracking. And bridges or decks are especially decks that are cast on um, precast panels or, or I, <coughs> steel I-beams, they have a tendency to crack. So, you know, how, how did we do it? That, that was the name, name of our title and uh, of our thing. And ha how we did it is we, we relied on an awful lot of research uh, over the years and contemporary research. I mean, I talked to a lot of people, read a lot of papers, and, and um, uh, put together, or at least we felt like we, you know, we, we, we put together that, that information and came up with uh, something that um, we're quite you know, excited about. So start out with a quote here. You know, ACI was uh, you know, established in uh, 1904. PCA Laboratories was about the same time, and there was this tremendous, tremendous growth in um, the material science for concrete between that, about that time up through the 1930s. So start with a, with a quote from Duff Abrams. Duff Abrams, as you probably all know, or most of you know, is the one that discovered the law of water-cement ratio in um, 1918. He was from uh, 1904 through the 1930s. You know, he was very instrumental in in a lot of uh, the, you know the, the concrete technology that if you pull a concrete book out or, or PCA's manual, um, it's those discoveries and our technologies or or ways that we design mixes were all, were all done in that period. So I thought this was a pretty good quote from him. This is this is at the 27th annual convention in 1931. He says with a, he says with a complete theory of concrete, we should be able to calculate in advance all properties and behavior of any concrete or reinforced concrete member or structure. And I thought, <clears throat> well, let's, let's, get into, let's go into that. What, since these guys were so well, what, what, you know, what did he mean by that? So we'll start out you know, with, well, what was he talking about? What is theory in, 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 the, in the, the way he's talking about theory? Uh, you know, um, how does theory relate to practice, and why is theory important to you know, concrete technology? Dictionary definition, well, theory is a coherent group of general propositions used as principles of explanation for a class of phenomena and phenomena or facts that are apparent to the senses. You know, so, you know, they're general principles to explain facts, you know, it's to observe the facts in general, not, not, not to uh, try and fit every, every fact, but we're, we're looking for general principles. And its role is a, is a cause and effect relationship of the observed facts, and its purpose is for better understanding in order to control the direction of events. So that's what he's talking about here. We go back to the quote, you know, when he says, you know, with a complete uh, theory of concrete, we should be able to calculate in advance all properties and behavior of any concrete or reinforced concrete member structure. And here we're talking about controlling deck cracking. So all practices are governed by some kind of theory. Before civilization, the, the theory might have been guided. Um, if they wanted it to rain, they may have uh, did, a, did a rain dance. Now that's bad theory because that doesn't make, make it rain, but, but that's, that's what they thought. So they had you know, poor understanding, poor, poor practice. The better the theory, the better the practice. And of course, you never know. You, you're always learning. So theory is never complete, and 
um, over the years, over the decades, over the centuries, over the millennia, you know, the theory got better and better and better. Um, and, and different, um, although at different rates at different t times in history. So, need to have some housekeeping, some rules of thumb. So we're, while we're doing this investigation of the phenomena and what have you, and the discussion. So the first thing, to start out with, you know, this is a, a, a Greek philosophy here in the Romans. This was stolen by the Romans. It says, in discussion, it is not so much the weight of authority as the force of argument that should be demanded. So, you know, we're always looking to uh, not who said it, but what they're saying and, you know, what the justification is. And as we come into, you know, our scientific age, as, as it was starting to develop, this is a, a monk, a, a philosopher in, in, in England, and he wrote, neither the voice of authority nor the weight of reason and argument are as significant as an experiment, for thence comes quiet to the mind. Think about that for a minute. That's, pretty, that's a pretty significant statement there. And I read that when I worked at the lab, at the, at the Caltrans lab. And it was their thing. And then this was, this last one here was, was a sign we had up there. It says, one test is worth a thousand expert opinions. So we'll go on from there. So let's go back now. And now we have our ground rules here. So it's phenom phenomena. Those are facts apparent to the senses um, that can be, you know, objectively designed. So theories formulated general principles explaining the operation of certain phenomena. Okay, so now we got our baseline. So 1930, 1930, a uh, article was written in, you know, Concrete International, and it summarized all the investigations up to 1930. It started in about, you know, it started back before the turn of the century. And in that article, he listed 11 factors that um, included aspects that, that, 11 factors which included aspects that, um, I don't need to read that. He listed 11 factors, and some of the factors were uh, just what attested the, uh, or, or just what affected the testing. And we're talking about that last article, by the way. We're talking about a volume change that, that wasn't uh, due to stresses, you know, in concrete. And four of those things were were mixed design factors. And one was the composition and fineness of the cement. That, that seems obvious. The proportions of cement and aggregate, mixed consistency. And when they mixed consistency, if you, you know, go through your ACI design, um, the, the consistency or slump of a mix is related to the water content, regardless of the cement content or what have you, it's, um, for, you know, giving aggregate and a given gradation, of course. And then the type and gradations of aggregate. So those were four things that he came up with. And so there was, a, you know, a lot of scurrying around on how to deal with uh, shrinkage during that time. And, and two gentlemen by the name of Vidal and, and Ehrenberg, and they worked at the uh, Denver Laboratory of the Bureau of, Recl of uh, Rec Reclamations there. And they discovered, uh, and as you'll see, this is something that's useful to us today, that they could predict shrinkage just by the water content of a mix, regardless of its gradation, cement content, or water cement ratios. Carlson, 1938, he, he, uh, he, or he confirms this. And um, quoting there, he says, consistency, that is, you know, the water content, uh, neither the cement content or the duration of moisture, curing has much effect. Sonny's going to get into the duration of, of uh, curing later. So let's keep that one in mind. Yeah, they were on to something uh, 25 years later uh, in a report to the uh, uh, Highway Research Board. In, in a study done by uh, the uh, well Caltrans now, you know they found the same thing that their that their that shrinkage didn't didn't if they held the water constant that the shrinkage didn't change um, as they added more and more sacks of cement to the mix they roughly got the same shrinkage value and it, and it, that that also held true you know with mortar so and the Bureau of Reclamations but you know put out graphs. And it looked like this. This is 1956, and there's late, later ones. This is the earliest one I found. But it's self-explanatory here. You know, each one of those lines is a different sack of, of uh, a mix with a different sack of concrete in there. And, and they came on to something here that dry shrinkage was related to the water content. You know, as you can see, and they, they note, that's their note, the narrowness of the band of influence of water content of the shrinkage, regardless of the cement content or the water cement ratios. And this is ACI, right? This is a 2014. Um, you can find this in you know in 2014 textbook publications that the grass been around it. But it shows the same you know the same phenomena. There, they, you know, it's dry shrinkage water content and shrinkage you know varies around that. So there we have observations of the, the, these facts in 1930s that we still use today. 
uh, that there was a direct relationship of dry ink shrinkage and water content. And this, this was useful and helpful, and it's still helpful today. But there's something that's missing. The theory's not complete yet, so it's still an embryo, because we also noticed in, that, you know, in that earlier 1938 report, that, uh, you know, the composition and fineness of the cement, proportions, proportions of cement, aggregate, mixed consistency, read water content, and type and gradation of aggregate, well, those were four things, too. Well, some of those don't correlate with the water. I mean, how does the observation of a direct relationship between, you know, a water-cement ratio and shrinkage correlate with, uh, you know, what was going on there with the water content? These are actual shrinkage data here. Um, this is uh, Portland cement and fly ash and water and some metacalin. And those are the cement, uh, and, and that's the shrinkage over about a 90-day period. Well, the, uh, the blue one's 14 days as the water cement ratio changed. The top one's 90 days at each point um, with a different water cement ratio. There's nothing there that's surprising. Here we have a graph here. I'm going to get back to this one in a minute. And here you can see that uh, clearly that the top graph has the most cement, or the top uh, curve has the most cement in it. It's, uh, you know, it, um, aggregate cement ratio is three, so it's roughly one-third cement. The bottom one is roughly one-seventh cement. Um, if you figure the 34 gallons per water in there for, you know, each one of those, then the bottom one would be about six sacks, and then the next one was seven, eight, nine, ten, ten sacks, roughly. The sacks would, of course, differ at, depending on the water cement ratio, but that's a good uh, handle to get an idea of what's going on there. So here we go. We got we got something that looks like it's the water itself that's the cause of the shrinkage, and that the and we know that the shrinkage depends upon the paste content and the nature of the paste, including you know the water cement ratio of the paste. So what's going on? Well, here's a graphical explanation. One on the left is a uh, five sack mix, I believe. Yes, yeah, a five sack mix. Both of them have 34 gallons of water in it typical amount of pro, uh, uh, concrete. And the one on the right is a uh, six sack mix with 34 gallons. There's more paste in the one on the right than the one on the left. Well, notice the, the water cement ratio on the one on the left has a shrinkage value of 0.26%, which is the number taken off of that graph from, from, real, you know, from real data rounded two decimal places. Um, the one on the right is, is 2.4. Well, when you, you when you do the the calculation, both of those both of those uh, th that cement paste portion there, they both at two decimal places they both shrink exactly to 0.018, and there's the phenomena they were looking at when they saw the water content. That's what was going on. Um, the uh, excess paste was adding more shrinkage, but it was offset because the water cement ratios were, were dropping. If you added more water. You have added more paste, and you, you also have um, uh, higher water cement ratios. So you can see how adding water to the mix um, will, will increase the, uh, uh, you know, the shrinkage. If you keep the water cement ratio the same as you go up, you have more paste. So as you have more paste, you have more shrinkage. And so there, that's that stuff that they discovered in 1930s and 1930s. You know how, how it relates. If you look at this right here, you'll see that. In, 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 doing the same calculation and, and pulling off those same off that same curve I showed you earlier, well, you can't just lower or raise the cement content and come up with uh, or, or come up in advance um, what the shrinkage might be. Here, a seven sack mix, although it's slight, shrinks less than a five and a half sack mix. That's the way that's the way that worked out. I want to go back here to this slide. This slide right here, and how does this, this this slide fits in right here? That top graph. Here's a 10 sack mix, 0.08, water cement ratio 0.4. Nine sack mix, water cement ratio 0.5. Go over here. That's roughly the same. You got a seven sack mix or eight sack mix, and so you can see, you know, here here, it doesn't really matter. It, it fits right in with those other, you know, that those other, that that other phenomena we were looking at. You can go down to the bottom, do the same thing. You can draw a line at 0.04, and you can have a what I say, that's a seven sack or an eight sack mix, six and and um, you know you, 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 and five. So that gives us a better understanding of what's going on with with shrinkage. If we take that calculation then we look at it, we got quite a, that was a four, you know that was at 14 days. 
which you don't get a whole lot of shrinkage out of 14 days. And, and of course, the, you know, the aggregate was different, but we can see it's not really near those graphs right over there. So what's going on? That gets us to the role of, that gets us to, an, you know, another variable here, and that's the role of aggregates in here to complete our theory or, or, to, or, or to further develop it. So as Rick mentioned, years of investigation have led to an understanding of the influence of aggregate. And uh, you remember from Raymond Davis's list there, there were two things that had to do with aggregate. There was a type and gradation of aggregate and the proportions of the cement and the aggregate. So first of all, let's discuss a very important role of aggregate, and that is that its rigidity restrains the, paints, the paste's shrinkage. So uh, the paste is kind of trying to shrink, and the aggregate's in there making sure it doesn't. Not all aggregates are created equal. You can probably know that. Uh, this is a list of rank order of uh, aggregate that's best to worst. So quartz uh, is known to be the best at restraining paste. It's the most rigid aggregate. And sandstone uh, being the worst in the group. So to conceptualize this, if we took aggregate that was very compressible, like a rubber aggregate, and we used it instead of rocks, um, and we made concrete out of it, we actually would find that the paste shrinks, uh, the concrete shrinks equally to pure paste. So that's a good way to conceptualize what the rocks are doing in there for us. So, in addition, the aggregate size and its shape and their gradation affect the water demand, right? How much water we have to use to get the workability we need. And they help us maximize the amount of aggregate um, per unit volume of concrete. So to summarize, three main things. It acts as a restraint. Uh, it acts on a water demand and it affects the paste content of the concrete. If we're using fibers like we'll talk about later, we can consider them to be aggregate as they help restrain the paste shrinkage. I want to mention here that uh, contaminants on the aggregates, like uh, clay particles, can, can change the shrinkage behavior of your concrete. And, uh, but, that is not a characteristic of the, of the aggregate. That's a quality control issue, right? But it is not to be neglected. So to evaluate, the Galtrans performed and finalized a report in 1972, which was of the Weber Creek Bridge, which is just east of Sacramento. And eight years we put into that study. This uh, bridge was divided into eight sections of 137-foot simple spans and that allowed us to evaluate uh, three variables that we uh, aggregate, cement, and rebar. So we used uh, two aggregates. One was sandstone, one was quartz. We used type one and type two cement, and we used the typical deck reinforcement of the time, and we also used a more beefed up reinforcement strategy that had additional longitudinal reinforcing steel. So. Uh, the deck uh, concrete was the deck mix of the day, one and a half inch maximum aggregate, uh, six X uh, mix, and four inch maximum slump. Notice it hasn't changed much. The, uh, so what was discovered? Type two cement and the denser rebar spacing did have some impact on the crack performance. After eight years, um, the spans having the type 2 cement and the denser rebar were again compared. This is what we got. Concrete with the quartz aggregate had only 26 feet of soffit cracking. We're down under the deck looking at it so we don't have to dodge cars. And uh, the sandstone aggregate had 533 linear feet of cracks and 18 of those cracks were leaking. None of them were leaking on the, with the quartz aggregate. So that indicates how wide the crack became. So the uh, reporter's conclusion was aggregate was the most important factor regarding deck cracking that was under our control at the time. Now, 
1965, the Structure Engineers Association Committee on Shrinkage did some work, and they reported the following. That first, the 28-day shrinkage that we're fond of specifying, 4x4 prisms, 28-day shrinkage, represents about 40% of the ultimate shrinkage of the concrete. And the ultimate shrinkage occurs after, oh, 64 weeks or so. So based on 20 years of testing by these guys again, Troxell, Raphael, and Davis, they reported, they came up with a classification system for concrete, Class A, B, and C. And Class A had a shrinkage of less than or equal to 0.032%. And you can see the ranges there, Class B and C. So B here is 032 to 048. And then simultaneously, the California Producers Committee on Volume Change in March 1966 reported that for aggregates in California, that 5% of them could produce Class A concrete. And 90% were in that Class B range. So this is why we're beating our head against the wall on these bridge decks, is the best bridge deck performance obtained at Weber Creek can only be accomplished in the best of circumstances. And there was no way around it at the time. But we're getting there. And speaking of time, I feel a lot more comfortable when Sonny showed me how long I took on that first part, because usually I take a lot longer. I was real nervous about taking too long. Thanks, Sonny. So to summarize here, here's some math to depict the theory. These are out of two widely used, when I was in college, widely used textbooks on concrete. The shrinkage of the concrete is equal to the shrinkage of the paste times the volume of the paste raised to a factor N. N has to do with the stiffness of the aggregate. And the whole theory comes together right there. It came together back in the 1980s there, however long before they published that right there. Now, theory and practice. Now we get to the practice. Cast and place concrete decks placed on steel or pre-gas girders designed for composite action. That's the key right there. They're designed for composite action. Creates inherent transfer of stresses due to dry and shrinkage. It's made to restrain, you know, the bridge is designed to grab onto the deck, which restrains it. If it's going to shrink, it has to crack. It's all over the country. This is I-7. This picture, I-7, looks like a lot of our bridges. Interstate I-70 in St. Louis. It's not, you know, anything local. I'm sure it's worldwide. It's well known. 1958, ACI Journal Proceedings here. Since 1958, in structures with a cast and place slab supported by pre-cast brains, the differential shrinkage tends to cause tensile stresses in the slab. Yeah, that's why we get the cracking. So now, where are we at? What are we going to do about it? We can't take the, we need the composite action. We can't let it slide on its own. I have heard where they heated up the girders and were successful at it, where they heated it up and expanded the girders and then as the deck, and controlled it, and as the deck shrank, they could control the shrinkage of the girder by controlling its temperature. That's a little bit cumbersome. But, so here's where we're at now, though, you know, barring something like that. So it's the shrinkage of the pace. And if we can control the shrinkage of the pace, then we can control the shrinkage of the concrete itself. The aggregates still play an important role, but they become less and less as we can, as we can control the shrinkage of the pace. If you think about it, if we can get the pace to shrink to zero, the aggregates are irrelevant as far as shrinkage goes. It's the pace contents that's shrinking. But we advance. Technology moves on. And in the last 40 years, there's been tremendous advancements in chemical admixtures. And we have that, we have that tool now. Chemical admixtures can have a major impact. We have water reducers that we can lower the pace. So we can lower the pace just with water reducers, simple enough. And we can lower the shrinkage right now with admixtures that lower the, are produced to do that, to lower the shrinkage of the pace. 
these kinds of graphs are produced all over the place. This particular one was done at San Jose State um, on a Caltrans project here. It was done um, when we were uh, uh, in the design stages of the uh, Skyway that you heard about earlier here and wanted to control, not for shrinkage, but for geometry control in this case here. Um, nonetheless, we got the data here. And you can see that these SRAs were readily available on the marketplace, cut into the shrinkage by quite a bit. We did it on paste. You can see it cut into the paste. The red line on the bottom is with no SRA, and as you add SRA, it gets less and less. The top curve up there is just to get a comparison of how much the uh, a paste-only mix shrinks as compared to a typical uh, concrete mix. That was like, that was like a seven-sack mix up there. All right, so now we know all that. And let's go back to good old Duff Abrams here. This, he wrote this in 1918 in the same um, in the same uh, article that he uh, wrote about the uh, law of water cement ratio. And he says, uh, design of a concrete mixture is a subject of vital interest to all engineers, since it is intention that each element of the problem is approached with a deliberate purpose in view, guided by a rational method of accomplishment. And here we, I left it down over there, here we, uh, here we put together really two quotes. Um, uh, the one he did in 1931 that I read earlier, and this one right here, theory and practice. How effective were, were SRAs in controlling shrinkage? Well, yeah, everybody out here, I'm sure, knows how hard it is to control, control sh um, shrinks when you're tr shrinkage when you're trying to put a, a jacket around something. This is um, on the Skyway. Those are the steel footing boxes, and the steel footing boxes um, were poured with, uh, I forget, I think it was a one-foot thick concrete jacket. And, the engineer out there, you know, um, had lots of experience with pouring jackets because it was Mark Woods, and he they poured a lot of jackets on the West Approach dur during the, the the seismic or yeah the seismic retrofit, and used to call me up, and I had no idea how to control a, the cracks going around a jacket like that. And he knew he had, you know, he had the SRA was used in the uh, in the segments to control shrinkage, so he just tried it there, and um, had pretty good results. And he also used it in the, you know, in the footings where he noticed there was radial cracks around stuff that, that protruded out. And we put the SRA in there, the radial cracks went, went, went away. So it was pretty effective there. You know, that being the case, right down the road here on Highway 80, um, about that same time, I got a call from an Alan Endeavor who's a Caltrans engineer. And they were putting up, um, oh, about 10 bridges. And they were doing it during stage construction. He called me up. And, um, well, typically what would happen is our, our, our structure engineers would, um, do everything that they're supposed to do, and they beat up the contractors to make sure that they're, you know, they got cured right, and the water cure, and they pull the rugs off, and um, everything looked good. You know, there were no cracks, and walk away, and then a year later, our maintenance people go out there and want to know what happened in construction because it was all cracked, and that, you know, what, what are you guys doing out there? Well, in this case over here, because it was stage construction, <coughs> the, the the same uh, bridge rep representative that was out there, um, you know, he pulled the rugs off and they weren't cracked. And as they moved on, he was still, he was still out there for six months. This, this project went on for a couple of years. You know, it's like, yeah, these uncracked bridges that we put down are all cracked. Hey, you know, what can we do? I said, I don't know. Let's try. You know, we had some pretty good success on the on the um, footing boxes, and I don't know. Um, I you know, I don't know. I don't know if we can reduce the shrinkage enough with SRA, but um, it's you know, it's worth a shot. And and um, he was a. He was a guy that could, um, <clears throat> you know, get around the bureaucracy, and then got, we got a change order written, or he got a change order written, and we put that in there, and, and here are the results. And um, I, under, I looked at the bridge, oh, five or six years later, and it looked the same, and I understand from, some, you know, secondhand information that they still look this way today. This was about 2002, I believe, or, or these pictures were taken, 2003, about a year a afterwards. Um, they're the same mixes. And you can see, the, you know, the remarkable difference in cracking. So we knew we, we had something. It's only one one bridge, only one um, you know one, one test. We don't know what all the variables were, but we we got something right right there. You know, given from that, we put it. We we uh, decided to put it in the spec. That was done by CCO. We put it in the specification, and this is a uh, um, precast. Um, these are precast uh, girders. Um, they were uh, spliced in two places. They're 208 feet long. They're on six-inch centers. They're eight foot deep. Everything, and you know, roughened up on the on the surface so that you'd have composite action. Everything you need for it to crack, and uh, lots of cement because it had, or cementitious because it had 
uh, 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 the requirements for the um, compressive strength were such that it required a fair amount of concrete in there. It needed 6% air because it was in the freeze-thaw zone. It should have cracked. You know, um, those kinds of bridges, um, I know the Sacramento Bridge over the Sacramento River, um, it was similar in a very good structural rep that was on there. And nonetheless, you know, it all cracked for the reasons I just came. So here, here we had a chance to try our SRA. Uh, this is a quote from the bridge maintenance engineer looked at it a, a year or so later. You appear to have been successful in mitigating the cracking, as the only cracks I could find were some hairline shrinkage cracks at the western land. And we took, we took shrinkage um, tests on there, and, and they weren't, this, this was not a very good rock, and they weren't as good, the, the shrinkage values weren't as good as we, we had hoped. We're not even really sure what they are because at the last they had to get this thing open, so at the last minute we, we stuck in another half a gallon of SRA to try and boost it up. We know we lowered it, but we don't know it by how much. So we were successful. Now this is the maze. It's on. It's um, part of the approach structures to the Bay Bridge in Oakland. And in 2007, um, these are steel girders with cast-in-place decks on there. They were done in the 19 late 1950s and some, some widenings in the 1960s. In 2007, there was a tanker truck um, that, that, that rolled and caught on fire, and it, uh, um, it uh, the, right here, you know, the lower part right there, you can see it, uh, um, uh, it, took, it took a segment out there. So we had to get this, you know, get this thing done in a hurry. It was all done in, in about a month's time. Uh, the subject of the concrete deck came up there, and we said, "Well, you know, we, we want to get this thing open. We'll, we'll have the, the other the other bridges are all cracked, like they all like they are. Let's put in a mix, um, you know, with the with the accelerator in there, uh, all the extra cement and all this and that, so we can get some early early strength, so we can get this thing open. Um, but let's try putting some SRA in there. We don't know how well it'll do, but let's put it in there. Well, here we go." It was 800, you can see it was 800 pounds of cement type C accelerator, everything that you need to have a bridge deck crack. And anybody that's ever put a mix in like that on, on girders knows how bad they crack. Here's the uh, report, um, what, four years later, um, 2011. On the existing spans that were all placed in the 1950s and 62, um, as you go through the report, um, you know, there was transfer, tra uh, transverse cracking, um, varying, you know, six inches to three foot on center. On, on every one of those uh, you know, those spans, as you're going through the report, you see the new spans, you know, none seen. I believe they're still. They, I believe they still aren't seeing any. So, with that information, we had Sunny up in District Two that went further with this. Um, uh, <laughs> you know what? You know what we were finding here, or actually, yeah, it was sort of at the same time. It was actually everything was sort of happening all, all at the same time. We talked to each other on the phone, but really neither one of us knew exactly the projects we were working on. But we shared at least uh, the uh, you know the information we were getting. I'm Sonny Ferreira. My honor and privilege to address you and uh, share with you a few things that uh, Caltrans has been doing over the past uh, decade or so. And uh, to ease your mind, uh, we won't have a lot of theory. It's going to be a lot of pictures. A little easier. The next 500 slides are going to go really fast. <laughs> All right, this is a, a picture of a $10 million bridge, and uh, you know, six months after the bridge was accepted, uh, we have these ugly cracks. And, and this is a for a bridge engineer. This is uh, about as ugly as it gets. As uh, was alluded to earlier, the two biggest causes that we think uh, uh, cause cracks in our bridge decks are the drying shrinkage and, of course, the plastic shrinkage. How do we treat our cracks? Right now, uh, we have a product called Methacolate that uh, we uh, apply topically to the bridge deck. And as this core uh, shows, under black light, it, it fluoresces where that crack is. So you can see that crack goes all the way down that, through that core. In uh, 2013, Caltrans uh, issued a fact sheet that uh, showed that we spend uh, fifty million dollars annually just on treating those cracks in our, our bridge decks, our existing bridge decks. Uh, kind of what's shocking there too is that uh, uh, half of those bridge decks that were treated were less than four years old. Uh, so this uh, this fairly early age uh, deck cracking uh, is is uh, you know widespread. Obviously, fixing uh, the deck cracks is a costly solution. And of course, internationally, if you t you know take our fifty million dollars in one year in Cal California, and you know expand it uh, to the rest of the world, it's uh, 
it's uh, quite expensive. So uh, preventing the deck cracks is a better solution. How do you prevent deck cracks? Well, there's uh, two ways to go about it. One is to modify the procedures, and that, uh, that can help you reduce plastic shrinkage. And you can also modify the material, the concrete itself, and that's going to help you with, uh, with both the plastic and the longer-term drying shrinkage. So here's the formula that we can, can, came up with uh, to have crackless bridge decks. It's pretty simple. We have ABC, uh, shrinkage-reducing admixture, uh, water-reducing admixture, and fibers. And if there's any uh, contractors in the room, uh, we add that to the concrete mix. Deck cracking can be caused from strains from uh, all these things, drying shrinkage, plastic shrinkage, uh, and uh, some other things there that we'll not talk too much about. But they're, they're important nonetheless and need to be addressed uh, occasionally. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about workmanship practices. These pictures uh, here, the lower left, uh, shows a guy fogging uh, right after the strike off has gone through. And uh, the upper right uh, has them placed in the curing compound at, at a fairly uh, appropriate time after, uh, after the concrete starting to cure. And then uh, on the bottom there, they have the, uh, the berline, the rugs with the water cure going down. These are all important things to, to uh, pay attention to because if you can't get the plastic shrinkage uh, cracks right, uh, you've already start, started off losing the, your battle. Has anybody seen this uh, nomograph? Uh, you probably only see this when the lawsuits happen after you have the cracks and everything, right? It's probably not used enough in our industry. Uh, we probably need to start uh, paying more attention to it. Uh, earlier, some of the presentations uh, you heard, that we, we don't do a good job of having uh, pre-pour meetings. In the old days, before you dug the first hole in the ground for that bridge, uh, you were thinking about that bridge deck and what you had to do to make a good bridge deck. And we've kind of gotten away from that uh, with all the, the, the speed of uh, technology and things like that we've got to go through today. But uh, you definitely need to have a, a pre-pour meeting, and not the day of the pour. It's got to be in advance. You have to think things out. If you have to uh, put up uh, shade or uh, screens, wind screens, you might want to you know, consider the, the time of day that you're pouring. Uh, these type of things so that you get a good quality deck. You, you get one chance at it. How do you counter these uh, drying shrinkage cracks? Well, uh, Rick showed you this picture before. Uh, around 2001, the picture on the left, uh, stage construction of the same bridge, uh, showed, uh, you know, you can see the, the white stains there that's uh, water leaching through uh, the cracks that are full depth. And uh, that's only after about a year of uh, being in service and, and being in stage construction. The next uh, year they went over there, and that's uh, when Rick said they decided to throw some shrinkage-reducing admixture in the mix. Same mix design, uh, same contractor, uh, different results. I'm going to go through a little bit of a chronology here of where we are, how we got there. This little bridge up on Highway 89 near McLeod. Incidentally, a lot of these bridges here that we're, we're experimenting with uh, uh, turned out to be uh, change order bridges. We, we, went, we went in with the uh, concept to probably put a polyester overlay down, and when we dug up the, uh, the existing uh, asphalt or the topping what was on there, we found out the, the decks were in pretty rotten shape, and so it didn't make sense to spend a lot of money on repairing those uh, when we needed to really replace those. And that's the case with this one. We had, didn't have a lot of funds uh, in contingency when we realized that the, the deck was in uh, uh, serious shape. Uh, that, that would not really uh, support uh, putting an uh, expensive overlay, o polyester overlay on. So we uh, put a, uh, a piggyback deck on. It's a, a pretty common Band-Aid that we do uh, where you dowel in, uh, put a uh, matter rebar, and uh, throw some concrete on it. In this case, we didn't have a lot of money, so we didn't have a lot of time uh, to spend uh, waiting for water to cure. We did it in two stages, kept traffic on one side while we worked on the other. And we only cured this for three days. And that's important to come up later. But we didn't really have that good of luck. That, this was a, a, a hot mix. We wanted to set up fast so we could put traffic over on it. We had uh, flaggers out there 24 hours a day. So the sooner we got uh, strength, we could put traffic on it, do the other side, and get out of there. And as you can see, the next year we went back and we found that, uh, gee, that accelerated mix uh, with the three-day water cure kind of cracked up. And that's been pretty much our experience when we try to do these type of things. Interesting, though, the next year we had a very similar situation where we had a polyester overlay to go on, a, on an existing bridge deck on a high, Highway 5 nearby this site. We took off the riding surface and found out, oh, yeah, this bridge has a, 
ASR in it, so it doesn't make sense to really put a, at least a deck, an expensive overlay on it. We need to replace that deck, so hey, we got another chance to experiment again. We actually used the same contractor that we did at Mud Creek on the previous slide, and it was the same mix design that we used at Mud Creek on the previous slide. And uh, the difference was we added some SRA uh, to this mix design. And uh, the, the other thing that we did was uh, we were behind K-Rail here so we could uh, have the uh, opportunity to cure it for seven days. I, d I did want to point out one thing here. A lot of experience that we've had in the past, we've either uh, tried to rub grout in on these patches or use uh, old to new concrete epoxy and, and things like that. And it's been my experience from doing these uh, for 30 years that uh, you know, a simple water, saturated surface dry, get the you know, puddles cleaned off, um, seems to work best. The guys selling the products probably don't want to hear that, but uh, that's been, been our uh, uh, experience. This is that bridge uh, today, and there's uh, no cracks. Well, there, there is one crack here, a small crack. I think that's a structural crack over bent cap, but it's looking pretty darn good. And that's in chain wear, and uh, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty high volume uh, truck traffic. A few years later, uh, 2007, we have a 3,200-foot-long uh, bridge over Shasta Lake. This bridge has a uh, railroad underneath. It has about 28 trains a day go by. Yes, that's less than one an hour, or more than one an hour, and uh, quite a lot of vibrations. The deck concept here on, on portions of that bridge, we were able to uh, replace the entire deck. In certain areas, we could only uh, take off a little bit of deck and uh, put another riding surface on it for stability purposes. These are number fives married up with number sevens. That's an inch and a half worth of steel. Add some clearance, an inch and a half clearance to that cover, and you don't have a whole lot of room for concrete uh, to, to work underneath there. As Rick pointed out, the, the, these are the uh, typical jobs that are, are, are ripe for indicating your, your drying shrinkage cracks. You're, you're really uh, restrained on the bottom, and uh, we, we see cracks on these type of fixes all the time. This gave us an opportunity to do uh, quite a bit of experimenting because this, this section where we're doing a deck on deck was about 750 feet long. We did it in three stages across the bridge, so that gave us a lot of area to do a lot of different things. And uh, one of the things we did here, uh, we, we tried uh, using fibers uh, as well as uh, just shrinkage-reducing admixtures, and, and in our control sections, we did nothing uh, other than uh, 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 fly ash and cement. I like to give a hat tip to uh, the people who help put our mixed designs together. Uh, it's a it's a team effort, and we get everybody's uh, experiences going along the way. This particular mixed design, we had a 10% fly ash in. We we varied our fly ash all over the place because you know there was a you know worries about you know too much fly ash not setting up with the vibrations of the trains, all this kind of thing. Uh, so we did a, we did a whole lot of different mixed designs on this bridge. Five years later, we came back and we were looking in the sections where we. Uh, put the, the SRA and where we put the fibers and the SRA and we're looking for cracks very hard to find cracks and uh, the bottom right is a core just showing you we thought we might get a crack there but there was no cracks and the top left is where we actually did find a crack we cored through it and as you can see the uh, you know, it might be a little hard to see here but the, uh, the fiber is sticking out the bottom and that crack right there is being held together uh, pretty tight with the, the fibers when we extract that core, it came out in one piece, so it's, it's, uh, it's pretty good stuff, R real durable. A little bit later, uh, we moved down to a, uh, a project on Highway 99. Uh, it's called Craig Creek, and this is Caltrans' uh, about second or third attempt to produce an accelerated bridge construction contract. And everything on that bridge was precast except the deck for continuity and uh, durability. They want to have a cast-in-place deck on top of the uh, precast box beams. Again, it's a ripe uh, condition for grinding shrinkage cracks. Again, a hat tip for uh, the people who help put our mixed designs together. This particular job, uh, we're trying to uh, accelerate the bridge construction, and so, gee, uh, it was at, originally came out to be in, in stage work. So we would have had uh, two stages of water cure for 14 days, right, if you add them all together, seven days. So we were trying to do two things here. One is we want to get a hot mix that uh, we could get uh, strength gain early, and so we had a, about a seven, maybe seven and a half sack mix with uh, no fly ash on this. We've already done our fly ash experiments successfully in the past. We wanted to see basically if, if we cook the concrete and, uh, you know, heat hydration, get it really hot, see what would happen. With the uh, fibers and the shrinking, reducing admixture, 
Uh, you can see the fibers are, are these are macro fibers. They're the long fibers, and they actually uh, kind of looks like it needs a shave out there after you're done. We end up grinding and grooving uh, for multiple purposes on this project. Uh, one was to uh, attain a quiet deck spec with our groove and grind spec, and the other one is we wanted to get the, the curing compound off, uh, you know, about two months later so we could ins inspect the deck to see if we had any cracks. And since I'm standing up here, you can probably imagine uh, we didn't get any cracks, but that's a couple slides from here. The workmanship, uh, the crew, standard crew, nothing special about it. We do uh, try to get everybody comfortable with, you know, whatever changes we do. We, we threw fibers in a, in a footing pour or something like that we had here, uh, let the guys understand what the material was that they're going to deal with when they got to the deck, and it was uh, not, a, not a big issue. Uh, but it gave them the confidence to, you know, carry on. We did a three-day water cure on this bridge, again, to accelerate the bridge construction. And we decided to come up with a, what I call a high-performance cure uh, regimen. In this case, we uh, put down our, 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 I almost said chlorinated rubber, our, uh, our pigmented uh, uh, curing compound, as we normally do, and uh, uh, what we call our standard spec cure. We came back with water and rugs for three days. On the third day, uh, we pulled the rugs and applied, as the deck was uh, still damp, we applied uh, another coat of curing compound and let it set up before we took, put traffic on it. This is a picture of, uh, of our high-performance cure as it's being applied, as I just described. Why did we end up with three days? Well, Rick mentioned earlier that uh, Bailey Tramper and Don Spellman put a report together in the 60s uh, on their drying shrinkage results, and they found out that... Uh, you know, after two days, you really might not get any benefit of water curing. Uh, there, there's other benefits to water curing, you know, for uh, durability and uh, performance characteristics, but for the drying shrinkage, it wasn't really important. And uh, they didn't have uh, the advantages of shrinkage-reducing admixtures or fibers back then either. And uh, so, you know, what we found out is throwing that stuff in there can compensate for some of the uh, losses that you might get with a longer-term water cure. Again, uh, this is in the 90s. Aberdeen Group did uh, some studies with uh, shrinkage reducing admixture, and uh, the bottom one has a 14 day cure, and the top uh, slides have a no cure. And if you sluice the, uh, the top set of curves over to match up with the, the initial uh, swell, the bottom curve, they're almost the same curves. And so they're basically saying the same thing. After three days, uh, you really don't see a lot of impact. Again, here's our our third day of water cure and uh, curing compound. Uh, we open her up back up to traffic, put some more uh, pigmented cure down, let it get uh, you know set up so it doesn't pick up by the traffic wheel loads, and then we open up to traffic. And like I said earlier, we did all this uh, uh, in a accelerated bridge construction fashion, and uh, we really didn't have any any cracks. Seven weeks later, we go back and uh, uh, ground. <laughs> with the diamond grinder, the surface of that uh, cream off so we could see that uh, uh, did we have any cracks or not, and we didn't have any cracks. So then we grooved it, the grooving tool, and uh, that became a, a real good, quiet, uh, quality deck. Uh, we only took 29 days to take out the old bridge and uh, build the new one and cure the deck and open the traffic, which is, uh, you know, uh, I think pretty good. We, I don't think we would have had the success if we hadn't had the shrink-reducing admixture and the fibers in there. And, uh, but it's uh, compatible with the uh, accelerated bridge, bridge construction methods. There's a schedule for people who like schedules. Uh, the one thing to note that we did have a, a driven pile foundations. We were able to do those off of the critical path in a different season. Uh, it took us five days to drive the piles. We plated over them, let traffic go back on it until we were ready to take down the bridge. We put up a temporary bridge. Uh, to route traffic around, and uh, we're able to take the bridge down and, and build it all in one stage. So uh, that, that was a, another uh, uh, positive accelerated bridge construction moment for us. Uh, two years later, we still have no cracks out there, so we think we're on to something good, and I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. These are the actual costs for building a crackless bridge deck. It's uh, 108 foot long, and it's uh, less than $3,000 uh, for the additives that we put in there. Now, you can't probably set up a lane closure to go out there and count cracks for $3,000. So, you know, preventing the cracks is uh, definitely better than uh, fixing them later. The mix design that we actually used at Craig Creek and uh, uh, the, the 
materials, manufacturers that we actually use. We're not saying that these are superior to anybody else. We've used different manufacturers of all these types of uh, products. Uh, they all seem to be per performing in, in, in our realm uh, equally as well. We've got adequate concrete strengths uh, to uh, put traffic back on it, and uh, it was a, a very successful job. So the formula again for a crackless bridge deck, these are off-the-shelf admixtures that are currently available. The polyfibers, uh, we've been using macro fibers uh, primarily on uh, a lot of these uh, efforts, but we are starting right now to uh, use macro and micro fibers in combination. Aggregates are from various different local sources, as you'll see in a minute here, and uh, we've used anywhere between 0 and 25% fly ash with air entrainment, no air entrainment, Accelerated ad admixtures, uh, water cement ratios from 0.36 to over 0 0.50, and had really good success. Uh, this is a slide just kind of giving you a, a geographic uh, picture of where we've had successes uh, using our crackless uh, concrete. It goes from the Northern California environment down to you know Southern California, seaside to the uh, desert, and uh, we've had, there's more than these. Uh, out there that are success stories. I just want to put this out there to show you it's all over the place. Using local aggregates. I did a little cost comparison here. This is probably not something you want to take down as an economic uh, pure fact, but just to kind of show you, if we would have taken uh, the 130 bridges we did in 2012 in California, Caltrans bridges, we would have had about 50,000 yards of deck concrete. By adding three-quarters of a gallon of shrinkage-reducing admixture to all those bridges, if we would have done it, it would have cost us less than a million dollars. And similarly with uh, three pounds of macro fibers, uh, again, less than a million dollars. So we could have had uh, 130 bridges built uh, in 2012 for less than $2 million. Uh, that's a pretty small, small change. As a matter of fact, if you divide it uh, into the construction cost, it's less than a half a percent uh, increase if we would have done all the bridges. That's our square foot cost. If we would have, you know, slammed that out, less than a buck a square foot, pretty, pretty reasonable. You can't even put traffic control up to apply your crack control measures, the methacolate these days for that. So again, the current cost of doing business uh, on the right there, we have a crackless bridge deck. If we would have done all the bridges in California in 2012, less than two million bucks. We currently spend 50 million dollars a year sealing those existing bridges. I can think of a lot of other things. I, I could build a lot of more bridges if I had uh, an, uh, an extra half a billion dollars in 10 years. And that's pretty much uh, a no-brainer, I think, that we ought to be doing this on all, our, our, all of our structures uh, everywhere. Craig, I'm going to introduce you here again. With that being said, we're moving forward. We'd like to figure out a way to do this on all our bridges. So we'd like to get what we're doing translated into standard specifications. So when we go about this task, I like to have a list of objectives. I like, uh, we would like the specifications to produce the results we're looking for. We'd like it to be biddable. We'd like it to maximize the flexibility for the contractors and suppliers working on our projects. And we would like to spend the least amount we have to to get what we want, right? So, uh, but that's a pretty good list of objectives. So to try to establish that, I think what we're looking for here is rather than have a one-size-fits-all shrinkage-reducing admixture dosage for all parts of the states, we uh, think we prefer to go with a performance specification or 28-day shrinkage value for what you need to pre-qualify your concrete at. So uh, with that effort in mind, we're still evaluating what that target ought to be. We've done some more projects here that uh, weren't mentioned yet, this is the most 99.113, had a 28-day shrinkage of 0.03. It had one pound a cubic yard of microfibers in it. They did that with a gallon and a half of SRA. This is done by a change order. It's six months old now, uh, no cracks. There it is. Um, but there's one data point for us, 0.03. Fowler switch canal, we just did that one about a month ago. We placed that deck. Had uh, this was that blend we were talking about, a blend of micro and macro fibers. The 28 day shrinkage value is forthcoming. Matter of fact, I ran into people here, said they might have that for me today. But uh, um, anyway, I had a gallon of SRA, one month old. We'll be evaluating that once we get the shrinkage value, help us dial in on what we're looking targeting. 
there it is we have more to go to help us evaluate cross down by a dark is in stockton we specify point zero two five no fibers will be using that to evaluate target shrinkage community city viaduct is in sacramento that will be done this summer and uh we specify point zero three for the concrete uh, that's a deck on deck overlay point zero three is specified that will have macro and microfibers also so here's the current draft preview here this is what we'd like to bet um one pound per cubic yard of polyolefin microfibers just specify it the uh we would like to put a minimum shrinkage reducing admixture in all the concrete regardless of what 28 day shrinkage you're getting and uh so a minimum of a half a gallon per cubic yard and a pre-qualified 28 day shrinkage value and we expect uh, that that will be less than 0.035 so once that's implemented across the state of california we will no longer be needing our crack comparators um, and uh, maybe we'll hand, hand those out in our next speaking engagement because we don't need them anymore. But that concludes our uh, presentation. That's what we did and what we hope to do in the future. Thank you very much.